I say welcome to John Walsh? And um, it's actually your seat is really low. I feel as though I'm towering above you here. Um, <laughs> um, I'll lower mine. I don't like it when I'm like sitting higher than anybody else. There we are on the same level now. Um, how do I describe you? You're um, a filmmaker, an award winning filmmaker, you're a program maker, um, you're an archivist. I mean, you're all manner of things, aren't you? You've starred in a, uh, a kind of what would you call the um, Tory boy? What would you call that? I suppose the industry would call it like an authored documentary piece. Yeah. But I suppose to the, the average punter in the street, it's putting myself in front of the camera yeah. and being the star of my own documentary mm. as a conservative candidate, of all things. Which you're not. I'm not. No. <laughs> I mean, I, I was briefly in 2010. I had a suit and shirt and tie on but uh, but no longer, no longer we'll talk about that later how did you get into all of this what was your background um well i came from a fairly strict catholic schoolboy background and uh so i went to all boys schools um but i had a super 8 camera my parents bought me a super 8 camera when i was quite young so i used to make my own animations claymations you know the kind of thing nick park would do yeah and the school had my parents in a few times and said you know nothing will come of this you know john needs to concentrate on his schoolwork which I can understand their motivation for that. Um, so I had to find out myself how to go about finding a film school and, and sort of, you know, bettering myself, as you might say. Was that easy? No. Um, well, it wasn't a sense because back in the day before the internet, um, there was only two film schools, the London International Film School in Covent Garden and the National Film and Television School in mm. Beaconsfield. And I applied to both and I got accepted to the London Film School, so I went there. But when I was 15 in 1985, I was a BBC Young Filmmaker of the Year on the Saturday Picture Where Show. You? You're joking. No. Was that with Mark Curry? It was Mark Curry, that's Gosh, right. Gosh, made in Manchester. That's right, yeah. Produced by my friend Steve Smith, wow. who I'm still in touch with. Gosh. <laughs> um, so what did that involve? Um, involved a dream sequence film called A Space of Mind. So it was a three-minute short um, where my brother has this dream. And, uh, he Is this dreams... your brother who's the accountant? That's right, Walsh Brothers, the other yeah. half of, of Walsh Brothers. A good, he's the good cop, I think people would say. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he played this person having a dream and in the dream he's being chased by somebody and when he wakes up, that person's in the room. It's so quite a kind of a basic three-minute film. But when I was 15 and got that award, I finished my A-levels, but then I was accepted at the London Film School, which is normally a post-grad course. Uh -huh. So there I was, wandering in, 18-year-old lad. Yeah, from South London. And all the other kids in there were sort of fairly well-to-do, I must say. Kids from America and Europe, whose dad might have been John Houston. Gosh. Um, or, or someone like that. Or Richard Harris's son was there when I was there. So it was quite um, intimidating from from coming from a sort of fairly humble South London background. How do you cope with that intimidation then when you're, you know, sort of thinking, oh my goodness, there are all of these, you know, kids of famous fathers? Well, I think it played in my favour because I was the one who was different. So a lot of them saw me as the, like their younger brother. So the girls and the boys at the school didn't see me as a threat in terms of my creativity or what I was doing. So they would happily help me and it would be sort of an, an, an arm around my shoulder. So being perceived as somebody's younger brother is actually a really good way of, of, of sort of endearing yourself to older, older people. Um, the problem sort of sets in when your films start to become successful and you win awards at festivals. You can kind of isolate yourself very quickly. Because if you're going to, I don't know, chemistry or maths or English or whatever, um, you have to just get it right, basically, don't you? Here, you have to be different. Yes, you know, I think the two things, I suppose the lesson I've learned in all the years working in film and television is that either be the best or be different. And if you're neither, you won't survive. And when I've talked to people about why they fail or why they've switched from being cameramen to directors and then had to go back to being cameramen, it's because they were neither the best at making the film nor had the most different approach. But can you have that combination? You can be the best and you can be different. Oh, yeah. That, so that's different things. Absolutely. I mean, if you can be both the best and different, then that's what they call lightning in a bottle. So when do you think you've been at your best? Gosh, I don't know. You know, I try and do something different every time. Um, I've... It's difficult because some people measure it by the awards. I've won national awards like BAFTAs and then international awards as well. Um, I think when I've pleased myself the most, I feel that we've... We've said something new, we've challenged perceptions, and when the films are shown regularly and shown and repeated, I think that's most satisfying. So sometimes it might be just a half-hour film I've made with some children, but it's really punched above its weight, and it's been repeated in the primetime slots. So Toy Soldiers was an example. Well, Toy Soldiers, I was going to say, and also um, Sofa Surfers. Toy Soldiers, I mean, that's about kids who has a parent that goes away 
to war. They're in the, the, the army, the, the forces. Um, and how did you come up with that idea? Well, um, around the time, it was around 2010, and there was lots of UK forces who, who, who were dying, who were coming back, mm. you know, uh, coming back dead. Uh, Children's BBC wanted me to do something as a follow-up to my previous uh, BAFTA project called Karate Kids, mm. which was Disabled Children Learning mm. Martial Arts. So they were doing something called Kids in Conflicts. They want to look at children and the effect that war has on them. And I said to them, look, I'd like to do something which is a bit more than just kids communicating with their mums and dads, which was what they initially wanted. I said, if we could speak to children about bereavements, and Children's BBC were very good. They said, yes, we'd love you to do that, but... In the past, when we've looked at this subject, we found it's been very difficult. It's not always a safe area for our contributors, nor for the children watching. It's very difficult to place in a schedule as well. Because of the timing, you know, yes, it's very difficult, isn't it? Yeah, so if you've got a comedy show, then my programme, then Blue Pisa, and you've got an issue around bereavements, you know, how is that safe potentially for an audience of children who might be watching on their own? And how do you bill it? I mean, do you want the parents to be with them or, you know, other kids' parents to be actually sat with the kids watching this? Or is it one where you go, I'll just put the tea on and you watch this programme that's going to bring you down? I think you have to assume that a child may watch on their own. So you have to make the environment safe for them when they're watching. Um, But we had the additional problem that the Ministry of Defence don't allow acting service personnel, families, children to speak to the media. So that embargo had been in place since the end of the Second World War. So I spent the best part of 18 months trying to get that lifted um, for us, get us an an exemption, as they call it. So how complicated was that? It 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 was a long and protracted exercise but to be fair to the ministry of defense i would have made it a long and protracted exercise yeah. because you know they're doing the right thing by protecting the most vulnerable people in this situation and i'd worked with the mod before for a channel 4 series called don't make me angry so i had good relations so they knew that i was a safe pair of hands and somebody who could be relied upon but it was it was horse trading i guess you know for 18 months but i think it it paid off and how was it when you actually got to you know speak to the children how difficult was that process well, we, we only speak to children who want to speak to us. So people often say to me, how do you choose the children? How do you cast somebody in this? We never cast. We never choose. You know, it's not like one of those shows where you find the prettiest kid or the one who's got the most to say. We say to young people through different charities, we're making this programme. If you'd like to speak to us, come to us. But we try not to sort of pick out the best stories or the most interesting narratives. And of course, it makes it harder for us then, but it means the person you do find is that genuine voice rather than somebody who's been pushed forward onto the telly. Mm. Um, It's somebody who has something genuine to say. And the little boy who featured in our film, Aidan, he was on the Today Show a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And he's, he's, he's incredible. You know, when he discusses the time, the day that he found out his father had died... Um, from a from an improvised bomb that went off, it was quite shocking. It's quite shocking to hear the film and the process around making the film was so impactful on Aiden that it's been shown in different schools and it's been shown in Aiden's own school so that people around him can better understand what he's going through. Because mm-hmm. we can all lose a parent at school, which is difficult. But if your father's been fighting on behalf of the country, mm. that's quite a difficult context. And also it's publicised, isn't it? It's it's there for everybody to see. And everyone has an opinion on that. You know, mm. should we have been out there? Mm. It's costing too much money. Why are we killing women and children? Mm. It's a really, di- you know, it's a really diverse issue and quite divisive as well. How close do you get to the kid? I mean, do they, they see you as, you know, a mate? Because um, they, they must have to sort of trust you. Yeah, that's, that's the key thing. You know, when you have a child's trust or any contributor's trust, even if it's a homeless man who's, who's, who's living in a wet hostel, I think the thing is if you have that trust, it's a real bond. So at the end of a production, I still stay in touch. So I'm in p- touch with people that I've filmed with over 10 years ago because I give them my mobile number. If they want to ring me about an issue or a problem or if we want to have a repeat of the programme, I will check with them first to see if it's safe and appropriate. Mm. And then I'll say to the BBC or wherever the channel is, yep, it's great, we can we can continue. So having a lot of juicy of care doesn't end when the production transmits. For me, that's just started the aftercare process. And I think the aftercare that we build around all of our programmes is something that a lot of different departments now have adopted. Children's BBC adopted the one we created at Channel 4. Mm for programmes around anger management for children. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, Sofa Surfers in just a moment and, of course, all of the other stuff uh, that you've done. But we have asked you to pick some music and you are going to be doing a spoken word as well. And you've picked tracks from movies, haven't you? Movie-related. And Nielsen, everybody's talking. Tell us why. 
Um, I love this track. I mean, interestingly, it wasn't written originally for Midnight Cowboy, right. the John Schlesinger film. Um, it was used as a temp track by John Schlesinger when he was editing the picture. Um, I was very lucky to meet Mr. Schlesinger just before I joined the Directors Guild of Great Britain. Um, wonderful director. I mean, he came from a documentary background. He broke down so many taboos. Most people don't realise. Like well, um, Midnight Cowboy in itself was the first X certificate film to win Best Picture in America. Really? And they said it couldn't be done. You couldn't have a film with an X racing, which is the equivalent of um, um, uh, NR17, as they call it now, or 18, as we call it here. It was very unusual for a film with that sort of content to get anywhere near to Best Picture category to be nominated and then to go on to win and win substantially it changed the way hollywood's thought of blockbusters right up until star wars so midnight cowboy won in 1970 and it was really john schlesinger who brought that new wave of british directors through that opened the door for alan parker ridley scott um, hugh hudson mm. um, and even uh, sir david lean who hadn't worked for many years suddenly found that hollywood wanted to speak to english directors Gosh. you know not british but english as he used to call it <laughs> back then and john schlesinger is the quintessential um, barrier breaker i think all hail john so how, how do you, you describe yourself when somebody um, say what do you do i I'm quite sheepish. My mum quickly told me, oh, he's a film director, don't you know? Um, I just say I work in TV, I work in film. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm, 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 I suppose I'm humble about it in the sense that although I make the films, I work with some really talented cameramen and editors. So I am a filmmaker, I guess, a director. But um, I think when you say you're a filmmaker, it encompasses so many other talents. You're taking the credit for the wardrobe mistress and makeup and lighting and so on. But um, in, in the shorthand, I guess, you know, writer, director. And you work with your bro? I do, my brother, yes, who, who's a chartered accountant. The money people are taking over the world. <laughs> and rightly so, because they know where, where all the money is. Do you feel comfortable with him being there as though you're being looked after? I think so, yes. And I think for, for commissioners, when I was starting and they were giving me lots of money, they looked at me and thought, oh, you don't look old enough to have a bank account. You know, how can we give you lots of money to make a programme? And I'd say, well, look, my brother's a chartered accountant. So if we get the cash flow right and the paperwork right. And, you know, television really is a lot about getting the paper compliance right which sounds quite dull because it's not very creative but actually it all starts with that, that word compliance compliance sounds like a doctor who word compliance word. uh this bloke sounds total and solid says john and the gravity drive saying um loving this interview obviously big fans it says walsh brothers um i mentioned sofa surfers before and this um when i was sort of reading about you um i went back last night i was on the computer for hours doing all kinds of stuff and uh, watched clips of sofa surfers and watched these two kids being interviewed and it's you know it's a sign of the times people become homeless and their dad lost all of his money didn't he sort of overnight virtually and they're living in a hostel and they were remarkable kids remarkably resilient you know i think people don't realize that when we talk about people living in hostels Mm. people often think of a west hostel where it's alcoholic men perhaps Mm. or drug addicts Mm. a lot of children live in hostels Mm. with their parents on 40 quid a week on 40 quid a week trying to work out what they can buy to eat exactly and and maybe having had baked beans that have been heated up on the radiator before they go off to school and you know sofa surfers reveal the life that children have to sort of make do and be robust because Mm. just because you're living in a hostel doesn't mean you don't go to school no exactly it doesn't mean you don't have to do what mum and dad says Mm. it's just another challenge for young people it was so sad and and but they were so remarkable these kids and they were saying that they hadn't said anything to the children at school at first but then they did because they thought well actually if you don't like us for what we are we don't need to know you and they discovered that actually none of the kids were like that and the kids were all cool with them weren't they they were all like all right okay um but they were just so interesting and, and loved their dad and loved the fact that he was trying to get it all back. And, and, and no, daddy will do something by the end of this week. <laughs> you know, daddy was going to pull it all off again. That's um, right. I think if you have a close-knit family, then, you know, problems actually draw you in. And people say that, don't they? When there's a big crisis in the family, if you're close-knit, mm. it actually draws you all together. Mm. And I think that's what you need to be. You need to be close-knit. If you're living in a hostel and, you know, money is tight, then, you know, you need to be together. That was only one example, though. You must have seen more examples in making that programme. We did. You know, it's um, it's interesting because when we wanted to do a five-part series, 
BBC said to us, well, how is it going to be different? You know, if it's going to be homeless people in episode one, how is episode three, four and five going to be different? And I said, well, I think it has, there's many different faces to this. Um, and there, there was, you know, we, we went through different areas, different situations where people had been made intentionally homeless, some unintentionally homeless. And we found a charity in North Wales that actually had a homeless purpose built village. Really? for homeless people and it's the only one of its type in the country so we filmed there as well and they hadn't really allowed cameras in before so it's interesting a lot of the work that we've done has been a challenge for us as filmmakers as well trying to get into places to try and tell stories that perhaps haven't been told before is that program still available to watch because i'd love to see that um, you can see episode one on the walsh brothers website at yeah. walshbros.co.uk you can stream episode one which was the oh. one which got us all the awards and plaudits um we we mixed traditional animations with rotoscope animation um which is a sort of a complicated way of tracing around the subject and it was children's bbc's first hd program as well oh, was it so for the geeks out there well we'll put a link on it. facebook uh, for that so people can watch i'm curious to know about this purpose built built um village so that's not going to be one type of person they're from all different kinds of backgrounds they are yes and it becomes it's like a microcosm if you like of of, of, a, of a london borough or any borough so do they have a shop and a post office and all of those things they do they have a lot of that on site and because it's purpose built it's little houses so you can be there with with your children and you have a sense of independence but you can fall back of course on the organization itself um, I can say the name of the charity, can yeah, I? of course. Uh, Save the Family, uh -huh. which is um, small in terms of its size, but large in terms of its aspiration, and welcomed us, and really is a, a shining beacon of, of old-fashioned charity values that, um, that really have an effect. Because as people come through, it's almost a processing situation. People come through, they get themselves more able, um, more confident, so it's almost like a... I don't want to use the word boot camp, but it's a place you can go for respite, recharge your batteries, move on, and maybe go back say, to can work. Can you move on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you don't permanently live there. It's just an escape for a while, as you say, to to, to kind of regroup. Yeah, like a retreat, I mm. suppose. You know, it'd be very West Coast to say we're going on a retreat, but that's what it is. It's like a retreat for for mums and dads who've really had it hard, uh, and there's a lot of resources there to help people sort of move on. Wow. Gosh, so that's quite moving, really, isn't it? Yes. And, uh, do you enjoy doing that side of, of things? Do you feel as though you're making a difference? I do, you know. I mean, the other, the other side of filmmaking is it, there's a vanity involved as well because as a filmmaker, if you find a story that hasn't been told, you're thinking, oh, I want to keep this to myself, my precious. You know, I want the world to know it's John Walsh that's revealed this story. So you have to keep the vanity side of it in check because when you're dealing with people who are vulnerable and have sort of um, vulnerable issues it's important that their best interests are, are put first. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by it, and it gets me out of bed in the morning. So how different is it doing that and then Monarch? Fill us in. Monarch is a drama film about the death of Henry VIII, and it's all set in one night, so it's very much like uh, Scott Bauer in 24, but he was shot in 1996. Um, it's very different. You know, it's 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 the other side of my my interest in, in making drama and making i suppose documentary drama because the situations and characters um are real and that is henry the eighth and his courtiers but the actual narrative is a fiction that he turns up in this manor house one night wounded and there's an assassination attempt or is there so it's a bit of a kind of a henry the eighth whodunit and it starred the, the late uh, tp mckenna the great Irish brilliant actor, actor. Fans. Brilliant actor, yeah, uh, and and Jean Marsh, who we know from uh, yeah. Upstairs Downstairs. Fantastic. So the film's been um, remastered in HD, which you often see on boxes now, don't you? Remastered in HD. We went back to the so original. So what was it in originally? It was well, it was shot on film, yeah, and uh, it's never had a sort of a wide release outside of cinema. It had cinema release at the time, and we wanted to track down the film negative so that we could give it the best possible look, and uh, and that's what we've done. We've tracked down the the original film negative because often when films are transferred from a print like a cinema print to videotape that's what people get in their homes and that's been the traditional way really for I suppose 30 years or so but with HD and with Blu-ray you know people want to go back to the original source material well if you turn around and the original source material is not there the look on horror for filmmakers when you think oh well where is it well it's probably in the landfill 
I was going to say, because even here at the BBC, they've no record of me until about 1987 or something. Lots of my sessions have um, were never, ever filed or have got nicked, you know, um, or have been lost. So it's very difficult to do, isn't it? It is. I think the onus is on the filmmaker or, uh, you know, or the artist themselves to make sure they keep an original copy or the original copy if they can. And yet so many filmmakers have found they've gone to the archives with the assumption. And I think it's always the terrifying word. I assumed, you know, any statement that sa- starts with I assumed normally doesn't end well. And, you know, major movies, because Monarch is a small film, major movies like Straw Dogs, Sam Peckinpah film, which mm. also had T.P. McKenna mm. in it, the original negative for that has been lost for over 20 years. So the Blu-ray release of that, that Fremantle released recently, was a, a combination of different source elements. And it looks as good as it can do, but it really doesn't look as good as it perhaps would have done if they'd had the original camera negative. But they've done amazingly well um, remastering that film and making it as good as they can. Because of technology. Because of technology, yeah. And Cabaret, the film with Liza Minnelli, the, the film negative for that was burnt in a dispute between the distributors and the producers. What, you're not having it, so I'm just going to burn it. Yeah, apparently <laughs> <Really>? so. <laughs> and that, that won Best Picture in 1975, yeah. 76. So, you know, major motion pictures have had their original elements either... Um, out of sort of um, irresponsibility lost or through bad management it was decided we don't need this mechanical source anymore we can get rid um but now everyone's running around saying we need to monetize we need to monetize how can we make a hd version of this old show well let's go back to the original negative and it's like well we threw that out years ago it's crazy and but you hear you know these stories oh they found another episode of doctor who or they found this or they found that how do they suddenly miraculously appear is somebody permanently rooting in you know darkened cobweb rooms trying to find stuff is yeah, that what's going on absolutely i mean in the case of doctor who specifically we had all the anniversary celebrations last year and uh, a man called philip morris no connection to the uh, tobacco company <laughs> uh, managed to find two almost complete stories from patrick trousen but in nigeria of all places nigeria nigeria they've been Why released there? well the bbc in the 60s used to make what's called a telecording and that's a 16 mil recording off a high quality screen and those film prints then would be sent around to different territories in the colonies effectively and they'd have like a two-year license to show the film and then they'd either return it back to the bbc or they'd have to destroy the film and lots of territories did neither and sort of misfiled them or, or placed them in their archives and if it wasn't for that a lot of these programs now wouldn't be found because the bbc used to <coughs> either wipe the tapes or um or you know actually throw them away if they were black and white programs so tony hancock is missing top of the pops lots of doctor who is still missing um even some color doctor who has been missing gosh so it's we can't blame the people from the past in one way because there wasn't really the opportunity to repeat content if we think now of the myriad of channels you can have a channel devoted to doctor who mm. playing 24 mm. 7 um, but when there was only icv and bbc one and no other channels you can understand why perhaps you might think well i don't know if we're going to show this episode of pinky and perky again or <laughs> whatever it might be should we really keep it um in the case of monarch was that your obsession or something that was, that was just presented to you no i wrote that myself i've always been interested in politics and 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 the systems around which societies build themselves and create themselves if we think a religion is a form of terms and conditions, isn't it, that people sign mm. up to, um, as you might sign up with your mobile phone operator, mm. uh, monarchies and democracies are sort of systems that don't actually sit comfortably together. So my film was examining the neuroses of a monarch and how the more powerful you become, the more impotent you become. And someone like Henry VIII was a great character to feed this this story through because we all know Henry as being this kind of... Um, kind of crazy ladies man who had all of these wives he beheaded them all and so on or most of them and basically bankrupted the country I mean he even debased the coinage so there was very little in it except base metal so he was like the original Parsi king um, but he had this softer side as well he was a he was a poet and he wrote music but I wanted to bring a new a new side to him I guess um, not necessarily a sympathetic one but just a different way of viewing Henry most people don't realise he was never trained to be king. So if we think of today's monarchy, we've got Prince William, who we all expect to be king. We have Prince Harry, who 
you know, isn't in line to be king, but he's next if, if there's an issue. Uh, interestingly, like myself and Prince Harry and Henry, we're all gingers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean a ginger king in a while. Um, but Henry and Harry are quite similar in the sense that neither of them planned to be king. They were both um, friendly with, with going out and partying and having a good time. And uh, in the case of King Henry, he unexpectedly became king. And so he hadn't been trained in the niceties of diplomacy with foreign courts. And when his parents were no longer around and his older brother died, he was really given the keys to the kingdom in that very sort of Disney sense. You know, how mad would you go if Macaulay Culkin was the king, Mm. um, home alone as Henry VIII? (laughs) And that's really what kind of happens. And historians tend to look at Henry as as somebody who sort of grew into this curmudgeon role, and he wasn't. He was somebody who had his foot to the pedal from from the very get-go. In my film, we examine that. You know, what happens when you've been so unpleasant to all of your wives? You've had all your wives, you've been. <laughs> yeah, and what happens if perhaps they come back to visit you on your deathbed as a series of ghosts in the amalgamation mm. of Jean Marsh? So that was very the clever. Premise. Thank you. Very clever. Um, all right, then, Elton John, and I guess that's why they call it the blues. First album you bought, Elton John, or? It was, yes, in the 80s. Um, I bought it on cassette. Too Low for Zero was the album. Um, Elton was going through sort of ups and downs, and this is the point at which I discovered him when he was having his, his up moment in the 80s, because there was quite a few hit singles in this album. And it's interesting, because you follow Elton's career, and I'm a big fan of, of Sir Elton. Um, he's had lots of peaks. I think in the 90s, it was with the Disney and the Lion King and so on. And then in the noughties with um the album songs from the west coast where you had robert downey jr doing that amazing video so i've, I've always been a big fan i see you have that wonderful piano in reception with signed by Elton. it's his piano it's a, you should have, have a go on it have your picture taken on it John Walsh is my guest, and you can find out more about John going to your website, actually, which is... It's uh, walshbros.co.uk. Walshbros.co.uk. And you were just saying Monarch, actually, was filmed in Greenwich, which was where he was from, Henry VIII. That's right. Henry VIII was actually born in Greenwich um, in 1491. And this film was is pretty much the only film about Henry VIII that's actually been shot in his hometown. Really? Hmm. Gosh, and uh, we've got lots of lovely stuff. Can't believe the weekend is here, and I'm really enjoying listening to John Walsh. Says Sylvia, do the other bit in a moment. Didn't catch the name of your guest. It is John Walsh. What an interesting and genuinely nice, caring guy. Um, all the best, says Roseanne Wood. And uh, this bloke, solid, lo- lovely, lovely things coming in um, about you. Um, you're going to do some spoken word for us. I have to ask you about Tory Boy, the movie. Um, just a brilliant concept. How did you come up with it? Well, um... I stood for Parliament as a candidate in 2010, and it was um, it was it was almost. I felt I had to do it because I was making a documentary with Gordon Brown, who was the previous Prime Minister, and uh, it, it wasn't a happy affair. And it was partly because he was coming to the end of his time as Prime Minister, but it was, it was a very difficult shoot, and it was a project I'd been asked to do by. Gordon Brown and number 10 called the Prime Minister's Global Fellowship and it sent young people on a gap year experience you can see that on my website too um, the behind the scenes shenanigans were very unpleasant and it really turned me off the Labour Party and I was I've been a lifelong Labour voter I'm a working class Labour boy from South London um, at the same time David Cameron said that he's going to open up his candidates list to everyone and anyone who wants to join and I kind of thought I wonder if that's true would they really want me you know, now, at this point, were you thinking, do they really want me or can I make a film out of this? Everyone says that to me, you know, and it's, it's interesting because I knew that my filmmaking skills would be useful as a candidate. And when I applied, I said to them up front, look, I'm a TV person. I've always voted Labour. I think I'd be a good candidate because. Um, and I embraced some of the conservative values at the time that they had in their manifesto. So they said, look, fill out the application form. You'll go for what's called a psych test at the Moller Centre in Cambridge, where lots of other people who also applied also went through the process. Um, In the end, I found out about 5,000 people applied to this open list. And you could be from any background. You didn't have to have any affiliations or any experience. And most didn't. So I applied, filled out the papers, went for the interview in Cambridge. And it was very nice. I found the people there very nice, the selection people, the candidates, people lovely. Came back, didn't think much more of it until I, I next found out. They said, oh, you've made it through. I said, oh, that's, that's nice. Um, how many others made it through? They said, oh, in, in what way? I said, you know, the other people that were on the uh, course. They said, no, just you. 
Oh, no. I was like, oh, oh, right. Okay, so I realised it was something quite special then. So I thought, well, I better be serious about this because if I'm potentially going to represent a town or a constituency, I, it's time now to really have a think about if I want to do this. So I applied for two seats. The only ones that were available were safe Labour seats. Um, so I applied for Redcar and Middlesbrough. And the first interview I got was for Middlesbrough. There was eight other people who were also up for an interview in that town with the local constituency party and uh i was chosen unanimously and the other people all had a myriad of experiences being Why a do you think conservative councillor and so on i think because i played to my weakness as a strength and i said to them look you've had people before who've been conservative councillors and have, who know the conservative book off off pat i'm a, a labor defector i've switched from the labor party so i'm one of them I'm I'm from London, so I'm not from the North East, so I bring that new perspective. And I'm from TV. Were you pretending at any, at, at any point? No, no. And people have said to me since seeing the film, oh, you must have known what was going on and you must have known you chose Middlesbrough because there was this story to be told up there about the, the incumbent MP. And I honestly didn't. You know, I intended making a film of me being a candidate, which was going to be a 10-minute film for news, but it was all genuine. Um, so much so that the Conservative Party have asked me to stand again for 2015. Really? Yes. Are you going to? I haven't decided yet. I'm flattered, <laughs> flattered by the by the offer. Um, so I, I went ahead and made what was going to be a 10 minute film to accompany my campaign. Ended up being a 100 minute film that ended up in cinemas. And instead of it following my process of switching from the left to the right and wearing a suit, going to work instead of torn jeans, um, it. The film actually uncovered one of the biggest political corruptions in the last 30 years and the whole story of Tory Boy, which is in the film for people to see. You'll, you'll see everything from expenses scandals to dereliction of power and everything else. And I was amazed. This story was just waiting to be tapped and unwrapped. It's and an incredible story. And mm. I'm delighted because I've only seen clips of it. But now I've got my own copy and I can't wait to go back at the end of this show and, uh, and watch it all. But um, surely you're not tempted. Um, I am because I'm very interested in political processes and I really enjoyed I, my time. I was approached years ago and um, and I won't say by who, but my other half said to me, look, you've worked for the BBC. If you do that, I'm definitely leaving. <laughs> he was just like, no, I'm not putting up with that if you go into politics. And he also said to me, he said, you won't last a minute because you're too honest. Um, well, you know, the, there is that side of it. I mean, I think, you know, film and TV is, is a kind of a horse trading political game at times as well because... You're always pushing your own agendas or, your, if you like, your own ideas forward. So real politics, I think, is about communicating ideas. So whether it's bedroom tax or other issues around um, renewable energies and so on, if you're able to present that idea in a way that people find palatable, then that's half the way... If you do that, then you can't do any of this. this well, You can't it, make a difference by doing, you know, those great programmes that you've been doing with kids. Um... You'd miss that, surely. I would miss it, but I mean, I think... I, this is the terrible thing about me. I never say no to a challenge, and even if that challenge is a bit dangerous. I had so many people come up to me and say, listen, John, just to give you a bit of friendly advice, I like you, I like your work. If you do this, it's a bridge burner. Mm. You know, you, you will be finished in television if you make a film like this. And you won't. And um, I didn't think arrogantly, oh, well, they don't know. I thought, yeah, you're probably right. So if I'm going to burn the bridge, I'm going to burn it in a way that's <laughs> going to be memorable. Yeah, in a big style. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you going to read for us, John? Well, um, I've got something from the British Library, which is um, called Pastimes with Good Company. Um, Henry VIII is, is known for being this kind of tyrannical figure, but actually he wrote music and there's lots of poetry that's been attributed to him. And why I say attributed is that, of course, because he was so dictatorial, we don't know whether he just grabbed some verse and said, oh, I'm going to say that's by me. Um, or if people were vain enough to say, oh, King Henry, this, this can be yours. Please put your name to it. Mm. Um, but I like to think this is one that's found in the British Library. When we researched Monarch, we went back and chose music and verse to create the score for the film based on different music that Henry himself wrote. And one of the really bizarre and quirky things we found out was that Henry always had a castrato vocal vocalist in his cause oh. and so that's a very unusual um type of male singer one wouldn't associate that sort of delicate singing with somebody as kind of as brutish as henry the eighth so a real another side and in our film we have castrato style vocals 
on the opening. So I've got a verse here to read. So it's called Pastime with Good Company. Did you want some? No, you're right. (laughs) All right. Here we go. Pastime with good company. I love and shall undo I die. Grudge who list, but none deny. So God be pleased, thus live will I. For my pastinence, hunt song and dance, my heart is set, all goodly sport for my comfort. Who shall let me wed? Youth Youth must have some dalliance, or good lie, some pastinence. Company me thinks then best, all thoughts and fancies do jest. For idleness is chief mistress. Of all vices all, then who can say, but mirth and play is best of all. Company with honesty is virtue, vice to flee. Company is good and ill, but every man hath his free will. The best ensue, the worst in chew. My mind shall be virtue to use, vice to refuse. Shall I use me? Wow. And you think he did write that? I think he probably did. There's, yeah. a, there's a sense of his spirit in there. Mm. And there's a sense of the confessional as well. Mm. You know, my film Monarch is yes. really about if you met with a priest and you knew it was your last few hours, what do you think he would say? So those moments come up in the film. It's um, anyone who's looking for a sort of a light romp through history, don't go near Monarch. No. It's a dark film. It's got a ghost in it. It's played by Gene Marsh. People who've seen it have been a little bit unnerved, shall I say. We've had a great response. The film's available on sale, etc. We've had a big take-up. When I made the film back in 96, it took me a couple of years to finish it. And when I did finish it, people were like, oh. Everyone was doing mockney um, dramas. It was all lock, stock and two smoking, whatchamacallits. You know, no one wanted to see costume dramas back in the late 90s, early noughties. Now, of course, it's all back in vogue. And, you know, Henry VIII has got those bodice, bodice ripping shows on the telly, hasn't he? Where young Jonathan Rhys Mayers is wax chested <laughs> and sort of doing all sorts. Um, so for me, it's been the right time to come back with, with a film I thought was lost. Well, I'm looking forward to watching it over the weekend. I would have loved for you to have written, uh, read something else, but we're going to have to fit your final piece of music in, which is Pet Shop Boys. It couldn't happen here. Why? Well, I'm a big fan of Pet Shop Boys. This was their first movie they made for the cinema, yeah. and uh, this title track was co-written by Ennio Morricone, who is a very yeah. famous spaghetti western composer and has done lots of great work in Hollywood. I just thought it was a really interesting mix and a very timeless track. Um, John Walsh, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you, and the website, once again, is walshbross.com. Uh, walshbross.co.uk Co. 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 and for the film it's monarchfilm.com OK, monarchfilm.com and walshbross.co.uk Thank you very, very much indeed. Real pleasure. Thank you.